sing, let's worship today. is good amen amen hey welcome to life connection church will you do me a favor you bow your heads let's pray together father i know that in luke chapter 18 you you had jesus tell a story about how we should always pray and never lose heart god i pray that we never lose heart in prayer we never we're just perseverant god in prayer, Father. I believe that if there's anything that we have been fighting for in our lives, anything that we have been praying and praying, and maybe it's a dream of our heart that has been lost, God, you can revive it. You revive the dead bones back to life, God. You can revive us. 
So Father, I pray in your holy name that we would glorify you, would praise your name, Lord. And we know that no matter what happens, you're still enough, God, for us. You're still enough. walking around these walls.
I almost could sing that song again. I was on, I almost fell over.
Father God, I just come to you this morning on behalf of this body. And I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is in this room. And Lord, I'm going to talk because that's my job. And I know that you will do your job. And that is to touch the hearts and the minds of all of us in here including me. And I pray that this morning, whatever's in the way of us listening to you, right now, would you give us peace? Would you make it clear to us that you are here? You're here with each of us as we know you are. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray your blessing on this time that we have together, that we all leave here better than we came in. Lord, I thank you for that. I pray for day, today for someone who needs to be let loose from worry and darkness that they're struggling with. I pray right now that it just becomes light and it becomes joy and it becomes peace that we can't even understand because it's from you. And I thank you for that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I started this series, 2022 Questions About My Faith. And um, last week I talked about doubt and wondering why, why we have doubt and talked about that. Today, it's how do I know my calling? Have you ever thought about that? You know, as a pastor, and even before that, when I was a therapist and dealt with people as a Christian therapist, people asked me all the time, I, you know, and it was usually after something had happened in their life, all of a sudden they went, I feel like there's a calling on my life because God protected me from this, or that truck didn't run over me, or I, I, I didn't die from that heart attack, or, or whatever, and there's that feeling that, uh, that there's a calling have you had that? I can't tell you how many 40-year-olds I've talked to that are kind of down and depressed, and they go, I really feel like God was calling me to be a minister when I was 20. And I didn't. And I didn't obey. And they struggle with that. Well, well, well here's what I want us to think about today. We've all been called. We've all been called. So, so what have we been called to do? That's, that's what I want to talk to you about today. If you're a guest, welcome. Thank you so much for being here this morning. It's always my desire, because I'm a teacher, that you learn something that will help your life be better, that you leave here today with something that will help your life be better. And, and I give you a little tool on the top of your notes right there. It, there's three questions that you go into, that you should go into anything you're, if you're watching a documentary or you're reading your Bible or, or, or you're listening to a teaching. Anytime, you ought to go through these questions. What point in this message is most impactful for you. That's why I provide you notes. You have notes with fill in the blanks and, uh, and it's a good place to mark and, and mark. We also have little notebooks back there if you'd like to get one to put your notes in. But, but what point in this message is most impactful to me? How does it challenge, change, or affirm my thinking? And how will I put into practice what I learned today? Those are three very important questions. Now, 99 point something percent of people in the world believe in God. They don't all believe in Jesus. Now, a lot of them that don't believe that Jesus was son of God believe that he was a, even, even in Muslim faith and, and other faiths, they, they believe that Jesus was a, a man that came and he was a prophet and, and whatnot. But, but uh, the Holy Spirit is what changes things for the believer. And, and here's what I want you to know, and it's, it's not there on your notes, but, but first of all, there are people who believe in God. Like, for example, there are people you maybe work with, and, and, and you're never real sure about telling them about your faith or anything, because at some point or other, they said something that you thought, oh, they believe in God. They believe in God. Well, like I said, almost everybody believes in God. A lot of people believe God is me. God's in everything. God's in that tree. God's in that. And, and, and there are a lot of people that believe that God did create the earth 
And then he spun it and left us. Now, they do believe in God, but they're called theists. A theist is someone who believes in God, right? So, but, but we believe in Jesus Christ. And, and what we learn through the life of Jesus, which even, the, which even the, uh, the Old Testament Jews didn't understand or know, is, is that the Holy Spirit, God, God is not only there, here, but he interacts with us. And not only does he interact with us believers in Jesus, he also interacts with those who don't believe in Jesus. Now, what he does for those people who don't believe in Jesus is his spirit draws them. He's not interacting with them as like he does with us. His spirit draws them. So, so the cool thing is when, when you interact with someone and you're talking to them about your faith or what you learned at church or how God has blessed you or whatever, you're, they're listening to you and, and they're thinking, you know, I feel like God's been drawing me toward him. They're not going to tell you that. They might. That would be really cool if they did. But, but, but you got to realize even the people around you who don't believe or, or say they don't believe, it's, they're being drawn. And they either have to run after and seek God or they decide not to. But he also interacts with us as believers. He interacts with us all the time interacts with us, which is different. And that's why when somebody is feeling drawn, it's so important that they see your faith. I'm not talking necessarily about knocking on their door and telling them about Jesus, but I'm talking about the guy in the office that wonders, that guy never goofs off. He works hard all the time. He cares and he helps everybody else in this office. What is up with that guy? Because my life stinks right now. And I wonder how my life can be like that guy. Now, you know what that's called, that that guy is doing? He's a witness. He's a witness. We are witnesses. Is John 17. John 17 is one of the longest. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus that's in the gospel. He, he prays for the people that he's leaving. He's thanking God and giving God glory. And he prays for the people that he's leaving. And then in the middle of that prayer, because he's, he's going to go, oh yeah, he's praying for those disciples because they're about to go out. And you know, every one of those, but John were murdered. They were killed. They were martyrs. So he's, yeah, well, I understand he would pray for them. But in the middle of the prayer, he goes, and for those that follow, that believe in me. That's you. So think about this. Jesus knew he was about to die. And he prayed for you. And he prayed for me. He wasn't going, save me, Lord, save me, Lord, save me, God, give me God. I pray for the ones that follow these and these, the ones that follow these come because of the witness of these. You ever think about that? You ever think about the role we play? Instead of thinking all the time about maybe, maybe what our calling is, uh, it's not on your notes, but if you want to write this down as a reference and look at it, it's 1 Peter 2, 9. Peter writes, but you're not like other people for you are chosen people. You were chosen. You didn't wake up one day and go, Jesus, that's what I want to do. I'm going to do the Jesus thing. What happens is, is you get pulled because you're chosen. You're chosen. Jesus died for all. And if you are a believer in Christ, it's because you're chosen. I never liked, uh, I always wanted to be captain when we, when we separated up to play on football teams because I was the smallest one and I knew I'd be picked last. But if you're the captain, you get to pick, you get to pick. But, but we're chosen people, we're, we're all chosen. There, there's not a person on this planet that doesn't have a chance to become a follower of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit. And our role as part of the, chosen, of the chosen people, the royal priesthood, as, as Paul writes, as Peter writes, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Are you? Would people that follow you on Facebook say, he shows us the goodness of God. He is such a good guy. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness 
into his wonderful light. So the first things on your note there, the first thing on your notes is this. Christians are called, empowered, and empowered to tell all people about their, here it is, experience with God. Now, if you get the Roman road down, in case you don't know that, the Roman road is a, is a gospel track where they tell you why you need, it's, it's all from the book of Romans, how you need Jesus because of sin and what you need to be saved and, and, and all of that is, is, that's called the Roman road. You can have that memorized and share that with everybody and God may use that to lead somebody to the Lord, but what needs to happen for that to be more powerful is that you're a witness of why that works, of why that works. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but we've all known Christians who were not a good witness. And here's the thing. You're a witness whether you want to be or not. You're either a bad witness. Oh, there's Christian. Another one of those Christians. Or you're a good witness. Or you're a good witness. And Jesus, Jesus prayed for you. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is right before Jesus leaves. He said, you're going to receive power. And he's talking to the ones that are following him because he's, he's right there. And by the way, right after this, he floats up in the air. How cool is that? I would jump on the bus immediately when that happened. But you know what's weird? A lot of people didn't jump on the bus because they didn't obey and accept the power of the Holy Spirit. So miracles, Jesus, oftentimes people were following Jesus around. He went, hey, you're following me just because of the miracles. You're not getting it. And he even stopped doing miracles sometimes because of that. You know, he, he knew the people that if they were following him, if well, I'll just tell you, if you're in this room today and the only reason you're following Jesus right now is because one day you're hoping for something good, better than you've ever had. Like you keep buying that lottery ticket thinking that Jesus is going to give it to you, you know? You'll receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will become my witness telling people about me everywhere. And it's not just about, we're afraid to, to, we're afraid to share the gospel. And we also seem to be afraid of, to live the gospel. Because if you live the gospel, you will have no trouble. You will have no trouble. I went to Brahms last night. You know how good of a diet I have. I got the healthy two scoop. I got the cappuccino, which by the way, the lady said is one of their most popular, even with children. So you learned something new today. And I got the chocolate chip cookie dough. And I'm just going to be a witness for you right now. That cappuccino is so good. And when you put it on top of a chocolate chip, you see the witness? I can witness. Now others, you know, last week I went and paid 40 bucks for a steak that was dry. And I'm being a bad witness for that steak. I won't tell you the company. I won't tell you anything like that. But, but I'm thinking, all I'm thinking is 40 bucks and I get a dry steak. That's a witness. It's my experience. Now what's your experience with Jesus? How do you go about doing that witness? So what we're going to look at is, is we're going to look at John chapter 17. It's 20 something verses. I'm not going to read it right at to you, but I'm going to give you some points. But I, I would ask you, especially before life group, go back in and read that verse. That, this is one of the coolest texts in scripture. Because Jesus, 2,000 years ago, was praying for the people that are sitting in here in Life Connection Church. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. And, and, and you didn't even know a few months ago you were going to be here. But Jesus knew from the beginning of time we were going to be here. What a witness. What a witness. So let's look. We're going to look at Jesus' prayer. Jesus' prayer for the priests. Now, you could, you could call this um, um, an ordination prayer. You know, when, when, a, when, a, when a pastor becomes an, uh, uh, ordained, what they're doing is they're being, they're being appointed to do something. Uh, at the end of day service, we're going to pray for Bailey Hale, who just became our full-time children's ministry and work with our youth. We're going to pray for her in the start of her ministry at the end of this, this service. And I want you all to be a part of that. But 
Let's look. This is Jesus. He's praying. He's, he's just been telling the disciples how about going about living their lives and all that. Now he's off by himself and he prays. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. You know what he's talking about. It's over. He's, he's about to completely give his life. Glorify your son so he can give glory back. He knows he's going to be resurrected. Uh, he knows he's going to. He, he knows that he's going to go all the way through without complaining. He's going to. He's going to have this kangaroo court, and he's going to go through an illegal trial in the middle of the night, and, and uh, he's going to get up the next morning, and they and they can't figure out any way to pr to prosecute him except that they want to keep the Jewish people happy so they don't raise up a stink. So he knows all of that stuff is happening. So he looks up in heaven. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Verse 2. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. So, so what he's saying is people are called, people were, are, will be called to Jesus and for each one of them that comes to Jesus and, and lives for him and believes in him, he will have eternal life because the Father called him, they call him through the Spirit to be with him. And then verse three, and this is the way to have eternal life. You ready? To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, Jesus is talking about himself, the one you sent to earth. This chokes me up. So we know, so we know that God gives us to him and he's praying for us. And, and what he's saying here is you really don't know God if you don't know Jesus. Now, if you're in here today and it's the first time you've heard that, that's John 3:16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever will believe in him will not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So that's what Jesus is saying here, which, he's, which he said earlier in chapter 3 when he was talking about this. You know of God. You know of God. Everybody knows of God. Everybody knows there's some kind of God. There, there are people on this planet who worship the sun and worship the trees and worship the other. And the only reason is because they don't know. Now, interesting thing I read yesterday. Muslims are getting saved like crazy. Y'all know that? Do you know where Christianity's growing the fastest? It's growing the fastest where you lose your life if you accept Christ because the religion that they're a part of kills them. Now, here's what missionaries are hearing when they come and share the gospel with a Muslim. I knew you were coming. I saw a shining man come to me in a dream. They're saying that over and over again. I knew you were coming. I saw a shining man come to me in the dream. That gives me chills. Now they're in a situation, I think, where it would take a shining man in your dream to make you be willing to give up your life to accept Jesus. But how many people do you know the Holy Spirit is coming to and God has put you there with them and you're not doing anything about it? just a thought, right? A shining man came to me in a dream. I knew you were coming. Wow. That's pretty powerful. But when you come to know Jesus, now you know God. You know him intimately. 
And, and what Jesus did for us and what he does for us is he models divine intimacy, a closeness. He's not a God that spun the earth and then took off and left us to our own problems. Jesus models divine intimacy, a closeness. You study Jesus all the way through the gospel, and he spends all of his time talking to the Father. And when he did things that were really hard, he spent harder and harder times talking to the Father. He, he, he modeled humility. He modeled mission, and he modeled worship. We, we model worship. We call this worship, but worship is how you live your life. Just like with, um, just like your witness. Somebody goes, gosh, why are you, why are you such a good person? Well, I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, I worship God. And my confidence, everything about me is based on the fact that I love Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Can you say that? You you, you can say that if you're if you're living out the witness. If if you're there and and you're you have that closeness to the Father and you have that constant communication and, and you practice his presence, he's there with you. That's the only way you really get to know somebody. If you're living your life all the time, even let's just say, let's just say we're a church that has church every day. You get here on Sunday. By the way, in Acts chapter 2, when they discussed the first church in Acts chapter 2, they met in the temple every Sabbath, and then they met in their homes to worship God all day long. You know? So um, worship is not just when you show up at a place to do worship. It's how you live your life. What if you woke up in the morning and went, Lord, I'm going to worship you all day long. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you close your eyes and put up your hands when you're driving to work, unless you have one of those kind of cars, you know. But, but, and I've seen a guy do that before. I told you all this a long time ago. But when I was going to DBU, I'm, I'm driving down I-20 to go to Dallas Baptist University, and, and I see this guy pull up, and he's one of the professors. I recognize him as being one of the professors at the church. And the guy was literally... I don't know if he's driving with his knees, Jared, but he had his hands up in the air and his eyes closed. This was way before cars would do that on their own. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I gave him lots of room. I, I backed off. Okay, God, I trust you, but I don't trust him, you know. <laughs> he may be smoking something. So, Jesus is the Son of God and our connection with the father that's why jesus is so important he's our connection with the father and because of that we have the holy spirit interacting with us all the time it pre-jesus the the jewish people had guys that were high priests and and they were the connection to the father matter of fact they were it was so it was so crazy to be close to god then that they would go in to to worship god and they had this little tent they would go in and they would go in and they would pray and it, and it was so scary to be in there you weren't allowed to touch the holy stuff in the room and if you did it would kill you now that's crazy this is the same God that gave us Jesus. <laughs> and and they when what would happen is they would wear bells on their pants and they would go in and they would have a rope tied on them. And if they heard the bells stop ringing, they'd yank them out of the room. Isn't that crazy? Well, guess what? We don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, we don't have a guy that goes and represents us and has to be holy enough that he doesn't mess up his life. We, we have that direct relationship with him. The old covenant was that. The new covenant is this relationship we have with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus was the only perfect sacrifice that could possibly happen. One is he could sacrifice for us because he was human. And number two is he never sinned ever and he gave his life for us who do sin on a pretty regular basis even after we find out that he lives gave his life for us we still sin but thankfully because of God's grace we're forgiven and we we're connected to God through Jesus Christ in verse 4 Jesus said I brought you 
I brought glory to you here on earth. Remember, this is Jesus. He's talking to God, the Father. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. He's about to go. He's about to give himself up. And then he says, now, Father, bring me into, glory, into the glory we shared before the world began. He's going to be with the Father in heaven. Now, I love to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story about Jesus that you may not ever think about, and it doesn't necessarily, yeah, it does go with this. It does go with this. You know the, you know the court, you know the uh, soldiers, you know the Jewish people didn't kill Jesus. You know that, right? I mean, if, if, if you just think that Jesus was just arrested and yanked off because he was doing a, because he was acting in a way that ticked everybody off and Jesus, Jesus did all that himself. Now, the best example of that, and go back and look. I can't remember what chapter it's in. But when Jesus is arrested, Judas brings people up there so they would know he would point Jesus out. Y'all remember how he pointed Jesus out? With a what? Man, that's crazy, right? Peter jumped up, got a sword, and he cut a guy's ear off. And Jesus pulled him off. And then the guy said, um, and then Jesus said to the soldiers, the people that are about, you know, and if, if, he knew, if he didn't know he was in control or God was in control, he probably would have run off and hide or whatever. But he said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus. Scripture says that they were knocked back on the ground by the Holy Spirit. They were, their power was, t didn't matter how many swords they had or whatever, their power was completely taken away from them. When they said, when Jesus said, I am he, whoo, and then he just stood there and they got back up and took him away. Now, I would say after he knocked me down, I'd have been running. But they knew that he wasn't going to take them out. See what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty fat, powerful. Now, Father, bring me into your glory. He's done all this. Uh, he's sacrificed. Nobody forced him to do it. He came because it was mission, a mission. He left heaven to come here and do that. And now he gets to go back to heaven. Now he gets to go back to glory. And thankfully, because of that, we get to one day be in heaven with all, with all the glory. Because Jesus is the first of many brothers and sisters that will end up with the Father eventually in heaven. Jesus announces his complete obedience and his return to heaven. That's just, that's just amazing. Look at the next verse. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me. Now, y'all know when, when you decided to call, when you decided to accept Jesus, whether uh, for me, it was seventh grade at a revival at Plymouth Park Baptist Church in Irving. And the best way I knew how in seventh grade, Jesus called me. Later on, I, I felt, I, later on, I was rebaptized because I hadn't lived my life and didn't really understand when, when I was in seventh grade. But what happened is, even as a seventh grader, the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to me to the point where in seventh grade, I decided, okay, I'm following him. I'm following Jesus. I have revealed to you. I revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. He's talking about uh, current, the current guys, the disciples. Verse 7, now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. Everything that Jesus is about is a gift from the Father. So we know that because of that, we're accepting Jesus and the gift that comes through Jesus of eternal life and a life with the Father, a life in the Spirit. Verse 8, excuse me. <coughs> For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it. And, I, and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. Again, he's praying for these guys, the, the, the guys and gals that have been following him up to this point and, and have already had some pretty major sacrifices in their own life because of that. And look what he says. He says, 
I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Jeez. Here's, here's, something, here's something you need to understand. We all like doing nice things for people, right? We always like, what if someday, what if someday you're walking across heaven? Now, from what I understand about heaven is, is there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So, so heaven is going to be like a perfect earth. It's the best I know that I can tell from scripture. There's a new heaven and there's a new earth. They come together. So, so you're there. And, and I think if you love playing football here, you're going to really love playing football there. You know, now, now the only thing that's going to be missing is we won't be married to anybody. And for some of y'all right now, you're thinking, oh, good. You're thinking, oh, good. That, that, that's a good thing. But, but we won't need, we, our, our, our wives, our husbands, we're, we're helpmates. We're created because we need each other here on earth. We, we won't need each other on heaven. But, but, we'll be, but we'll just enjoy living there and the Father will be with us. Does it ever blow you away when it said, Adam and Eve are in the garden and boy, they screwed up and all of a sudden, they heard God walking in the garden. Well, that scared them to death. Not us. We'll be worshiping. Oh, here comes God again. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like a party everywhere we go. Every time God shows up, there, there will just be a party. That's just my thought. That's just what I think. I, I think that's in context some way. <laughs> God called his disciples, Jesus delivered the message, and they accepted. That's, that's really, this, he's talking about the, the ones with him there, but this is, this is what it looks like. If you're in here today and you're going, how do I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior? How do I become a Christian? Well, that's it. God calls you. You're given the message because now it's our job to give the message, and then they accept it. And you really don't have to jump through hoops and, and do a bunch of rules and everything for that to happen because, because of God's grace. Because of God's grace. My prayer is not for the world, but those you have given me because they belong to you. They belong to you. He's praying this whole prayer, the longest prayer Jesus ever does that's written down in John's gospel is, is saying that is saying that his prayer is not for everybody in the world, but for those of us that God has given him and we have become followers of Jesus Christ. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me. So here we go. Now remember just a minute ago, he said, okay, now I finished my job here and I'm about to go and be in your glory. I'm giving you glory by, by dying and, and then you're giving me glory and then... It's our job to bring Jesus glory. So again, you got to ask yourself, am I, when I go around doing life, am I giving Jesus glory? Am I doing it by my actions? Am I, am I doing it by my witness? That's, that's the most important thing is, as we go along. Jesus is glorified through our discipleship. And we need each other so bad for that. Our life group didn't meet last week uh, for different reasons, but we're back with our life group tonight. And we're going to talk about this message from the notes that are in there. And I'm going to learn something from the other people in my group. I'm going to learn from their witness. I, I'm, they're going to they're gonna say something. Michelle, you learn things from your people in your group, right? Isn't that the most in, cool thing about being in a group is, is we always wonder, am I doing the right thing? Is this, does anybody else feel like this? Is this hard for anybody else? And then you hear other people and you, and you hear people that are mature spiritually more than you are uh, saying things. And you hear people that are not as mature spiritually as you are saying things that will just sometimes completely blow your mind. And on top of that, we get snacks right before we start. <laughs> we have a pretty good time in the kitchen. We have a pretty good time in the kitchen. 
by the way, I'm, that's just a little press for the uh, life group. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check it on your bulletin and, and we will contact you. But Jesus is glorified through our discipleship. Now I'm departing, Jesus says, from the world. They're staying in this world, but I am coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Now, watch this. Protect me. Now, he's talking specifically about the disciples there. Because, and, and I'll just tell you, he protected them very good because they all died a martyr's death. You got to realize that uh, part of the confidence that we have in our faith is when bad things happen, God makes it good things for a reason. You can take just about anything if, if, if you have the hope that knowing that something is going to be good, it's going to make things better, right? You, have you noticed that in your own life? Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united as we are. God wants us united. And this is the thing I think that, you've heard me say this before, I think, and I know people are saying we're getting persecuted as Christians. No, the people in Saudi Arabia are getting persecuted because they're Christians. It's just a little hard for us sometimes. But there's going to come a time, I believe, scripturally, and I don't know when, when the pressure is going to make the division between churches go away. There won't be Methodists. There won't be Baptists. There won't be Catholics. There won't be Episcopalians. We will be Christ followers. And we will need each other so bad because it'll be hard to do it on our own. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that by my heart. You see that in places where, where Christians are greatly persecuted, how, how hard it is for them. And, and yet they're willing to give up their lives even, even when they're given a chance. You can, you can die or you can stop believing in Jesus. They go, nope, I'll take death. I'll take death because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I'll take that. Now I'm coming to you, Lord. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. Do you have joy in your life? Do you? Because if you don't, you're doing something wrong. I'm just telling you. And maybe we ought to have a joy class. Would you come to a joy class if we had a joy class? I mean, we'll, we'll do something to, to figure that out. I'll tell you a few dad jokes. We'll, we'll do some things. And, but, but, but it's the joy. It's the joy of knowing where I'm going. It's the joy of knowing that this horrible thing that seems to be happening right now, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know God's going to use it. I know that my witness, when I go through the hard times, look, when you're, when you're going through the good times and, and everything seems to be good, your witness, quite honestly, isn't as good as it is when you're going through the bad. Because people are impressed by people that handle bad well. That means no whining. There's no crying in baseball. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just being who God wants us to be and we'll be filled with joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them because, because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. And, and this is the, this is the I, I'll just tell you, um, I'm hesitant to tell somebody I'm a pastor because all of a sudden they treat me different. And some of them just look mad. And some of them just go, oops, because they think I'm going to judge them. I mean, that's, that, that's the way it is. And in the world, they're in a world crazy where people are, are, are hating on them. And, and, and the, first, the first century or two of Christianity, uh, it was horrible the way they treated Christians. And guess what happened? It grew exponentially. Christians took over the world while they were being executed and treated horribly and thrown in jail and used as torches at rich people's parties and everything else because they were Christians and it didn't matter. But that's when Christianity grew. It didn't run anybody away from Christianity. That's why in the Middle East, it's the fastest place that Christianity is growing. 
because that's where they're being persecuted and hurt the most. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. (laughs) Can I just... I know some Christians that all they say is, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. Golly, that is going to be awesome. But it's going to be way more awesome when you see a bunch of people you know there because Jesus didn't come back too early. He's going to come back when he's ready. And I hope for you it's not an uh uh-oh moment. I hope for you it's a hallelujah moment and you see a whole lot of people. Scripture says we're going to know people that we've known in heaven. It does. There's going, to be a, there's going to be a familiarity. I don't know what age we're going to be. I don't know anything like that, but, but we're going to know. And isn't that cool? Wouldn't that be? What if when you got there and, and you got to the gate and they let you in and they said, here's your highlight film. Because I, I think people think when they get to the gate, we're going to get judged. <laughs> the judgment is gone. There is no judgment because of God's grace. But I think there's going to be a highlight film. I think we're going to sit down and we're going to see. That, and, and here's the weird deal. Let's just say, let's just say, I lead you to the Lord, or, or I just say something. Or maybe you're visiting here for the first time today, and I've said something to you, and and you've taken that out, and you've told somebody else, and then one day you become a Christian, and just and just we never know. We have no idea all the people that we've impacted. We don't know online. We don't know the people we see. We don't know the people that we've run into and that we've been kind. We don't know if we were honoring God to help somebody. And then we went on. We knew nothing was going on in their life. And and then all of a sudden we see them in heaven. Hey, weren't you that person that I saw at Kroger? Yes. I was having a hard time. You gave me 20 bucks and said, God bless you. And then you said, can I help you with something else? There's something else I do. Do you need more? Do I need to go to the bank and get you some more money? I... See, that's witness. That's a witness. That's what changes people's lives. Keep them safe from the evil one. The truth of Jesus gives us joy during our difficult mission as we go along. Make them holy, Lord, he says, by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. If you, we've got to be, we've got to be involved with the word of God. We've got to. You're going to get taught here the word of God always. That will always happen. There will never just be a motivational speech. Sometimes you'll go, man, this guy's got a lot of scripture today. That's okay. Just suck it up and get better because of that. Because that's the way it is. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. When you go and you discuss it with your life group, now you're learning new things from the people in your life group. Group that different than what I taught you. And I'll tell you something, and the Holy Spirit will teach you something completely different than I did from that passage. That's how it works. He says, make them holy. You know what holy means? It means to be used by God. Are you holy? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, are you being used by God? Because if you're holy, you're been made, you've been set aside to be used, to be used by God. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. Being close to God allows us to be in the world while not like the world. Not weird in a way that we say silly things and we judge people and all that. But we're... We're not like the world because we love people no matter what. If we're holy, if we live our holy lives, we're, we're generous, we're kind. We do things that people just don't expect and for the right reason. We're there for people when they're hurting. We're, those are things that we do. We, we generously uh, support ministries and support people who need support. O righteous Father, Jesus said, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Have you answered your calling? Like I said, people come to me all the time, and it's like this. I really feel like God's calling me to do something. He is. He's calling you to be a witness. And then what happens, guess what? When you get to be where you're a witness and you're following and doing what God wants and you're studying God's word, then he starts putting you into places that you just couldn't imagine you would be. If you'd asked me 30 years ago if I'd been a pastor, 
I would have said, you're crazy. But it just came naturally. Maybe supernaturally is the word. It just came. The, I got excited about God, started serving God every single way, started being a witness, and boom, 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 boom. I don't know what God's got planned for you. Maybe he just wants you to be the most holy person in your office. And then that will lead to something out of there too. I mean, that's the way it works. How about you? Have you answered your calling? In just a moment, we're going to pray for Bailey. And Bailey has answered her calling. The best way she knows how, she's answered her calling. And she's become our children's minister. And she's going to be working with our youth. And she's going to be doing some other things within uh, the structure of our church. And we're going to pray for her. Because she's putting herself on the front lines of ministry. And I want to tell you something. Thousands of people in ministry quit every year because it gets hard. Because it gets hard. But we can take these promises that we have from God and we can live out that ministry even when it's hard. I wake up a lot of Monday mornings and go, okay, God, are you sure you want me to keep doing this? And he goes, yeah, you know, if you quit right now, you're going to miss what I got for you tomorrow. That wakes me up, you know. So let me pray, and then we're going to end our service, and then Bailey's going to come up here, and we're, going to, we're not going to gather around her and put hands on her and all because of whatever, COVID or whatever other nervousness there is in here. But what we'll do is we'll stand and we'll pray. And if I could have the elders come up and just kind of stand uh, on the front, right, the, the elders that are here, and, and we'll pray for that. We'll pray for her. So, Father God, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for how much you love us. I thank you that you sacrificed your life for us, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we sacrifice our lives for you. I pray that we live a holy life. I pray that it's obvious that there's something good about us that people can't understand and they want to know. So when your spirit is drawing them, we can be there to be the witness. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the Muslims that, that need a shining person to show up in their dreams, to show them that you're real. And then the awesome missionaries that show up and confirm what they've heard in their dreams. I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that we're those people. People's lives are changed because of us. And I pray this in Jesus' name.